This video is brought to you by Skillshare. The world holds many blessings for those of us fortunate enough to have been born in the 21st century. Airplanes can take us to far away places it previously took a lifetime to reach. And modern day shipping makes it possible for you to get products and delights from distant lands. But as we've grown more aware of the world around us, the old adage, nothing comes for free, rears its head again. Shipping and air travel account for 8% of global emissions today. And the batteries that will eventually phase out internal combustion engines are currently too heavy for machines built to battle gravity. And shipping. Well, the whole idea is to transport a lot of heavy stuff. If half of the heavy stuff is batteries, the economics change substantially. For the worse, just to be clear. So what is a technologically inclined humanoid society to do in such a situation? We have previously spoken of hydrogen as the future fuel of these sectors. The European Union, Japan and many other political entities are planning major investments around that future, while promising that would necessitate a massive overhaul and transformation of the fleets, which would come at great expense and add inertia to an already slow-moving system. There could be another way though. Have you heard the good news about solar reactors? All good things flow from the sun. Not for nothing did our ancestors bow down to Sol the Magnificent every morning. It churns hydrogen in its belly, fusing it into the heavier elements from which all things are made. In the process, energy is released that bounces around inside the sun for a few hundred thousand years. This blinding white wave then hits our atmosphere, which scatters the blue frequencies, leaving the faintly yellow light so adored by all the creatures of the Earth. Even though we only get a small fraction of this energy, it is enough to power the cycles of life, the weather, and the entirety of humanity's industrial production far into the future. It is no surprise then that the world is in the midst of a revolution in harnessing this gift. And many see it as the only way we can leave hydrocarbons alone to rest deep within the Earth. But sunlight is diffuse. The nuclear fury of our celestial companion is reduced to only a warm, comfortable glow by the time it reaches us. But we can focus it, just like a magnifying glass can concentrate the energy falling on the entirety of the glass into a small point hot enough to light a fire. The Greek inventor Archimedes famously and perhaps apocryphally used mirrors to direct the sun's gaze at the ships of the invading Roman fleet. Scientists at the ETH Zurich have been using the same method to power a refinery that can distill carbon-neutral fuel from sunlight and air. The solar radiation is concentrated 3000 to 1, achieving a temperature of 1500 degrees at the focus. Carbon dioxide and water are pulled in from the air through the process of absorption, meaning we use compounds like zeolite and metal organic frameworks to get carbon dioxide to preferentially stick on their surfaces, while the other components of air just pass through. These materials are then pumped to the focus of the solar concentrator. The solar reactor is lined on the inside with a ceramic called cerium oxide. When heated to 1500 degrees, it gets reduced and oxygen gets released. The carbon dioxide and water are then fed into this reactor and combined together to produce syngas, a combination of hydrogen and carbon monoxide, releasing oxygen. This oxygen reacts back to reconstitute the cerium oxide and the process can then repeat. The heat is mostly required to remove oxygen from cerium oxide. The reduction of water and carbon dioxide proceeds without heat input. So they operate two solar reactors in parallel to increase efficiency. This syngas can be used in the production of a variety of hydrocarbon fuels, like methanol and gasoline, and can also be used to get hydrogen and ammonia. Crucially, it can be used to create kerosene, aviation fuel, with no modifications required to current jet engines to make it work. Thus, this is a drop in fuel. You just use a tanker of this instead of whatever you were using so far, and it will work without a hitch. And the only carbon that goes into the air is what you pulled out of it in the first place. So it is 100% carbon neutral. Researchers have been running this system for two years on the roof of their laboratory and have been able to develop a proof of concept, publishing about it in Nature magazine. It must have taken real skill to do that. Speaking of which, here's a word from our sponsor. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people. Explore new skills, develop existing interests, and get lost in creativity. It's curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads. I use it a lot for my social media journey. And currently, I'm going through Social Media for the Creative Entrepreneur by Peggy Dean. 
When you join, you can try one of Skillshare's live classes. Experience real-time inspiration as you connect with popular teachers while watching and working along with other members. The first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. So you can start exploring your creativity today. Running the system for an entire day produced half a deciliter of pure methylon. So 50 milliliters, enough to take you a kilometer and a half in a typical passenger aircraft. Aldo Steinfeld, the scientist leading this effort, acknowledges that there is some way to go yet. At the solar reactor, they're at an efficiency of 5.6%. That likely means that from 100 units of energy input using the solar concentrator, they're getting five units of energy worth of fuel. That's a world record for solar thermochemical splitting. But according to Steinfeld, it can get much better. By using heat recovery techniques during the reduction and oxidation reactions, they can possibly increase it to 20%. They're currently running the system off a 5 kilowatt solar installation. But keep in mind that this is Zurich, where conditions for solar power are not nearly as good as in some other parts of the world. So how much does all of this cost? Well, the price of solar panels is well known. We can also attach some numbers to direct air capture of carbon dioxide. It's a lot. Steinfeld doesn't believe that in its current avatar, this technology is in a place to be adopted at any kind of scale. Making flight tickets more expensive is just not feasible. So he proposes a slow switch. Initially, governments mandate that airlines use 1% of synthetic fuel in their mix. That would have a negligible impact on the prices. Then as economies of scale start kicking in, you can increase it to 2%. As the technology and associated materials keep getting cheaper, we keep increasing the percentage of synthetic fuel until it reaches 100%. Will it ever get there? If you look at the best case scenario, probably not. The only way it comes out on top is if you compare it to the cost of just offsetting the carbon emissions from jet fuel directly through carbon capture. So while it looks like a promising first step, at this point of time, there is nothing to suggest that this will be the way of the future. Again, industry needs to find synergies. Governments need to find the will to institute carbon taxes. And we need to prepare to accept levels of existence that may be a little less than what we're used to. There are already companies taking up the challenge. Notably, Climeworks, a carbon capture company backed by Bill Gates. And Sin Helion. Biofuels are not generally popular among the renewable community. And there are good reasons for that. Using arable land to produce fuel feels like a bit of waste. This technology is definitely more promising in that respect because it would work best in a desert environment with lots of uninterrupted sunshine. And yes, they've clarified that there is enough moisture in the desert air to make this process feasible. So it has that going for it. Even if the bulbous hydrogen planes of the future seem more futuristic, we have to explore all possible options. As we keep reiterating on the channel, putting all our eggs in one basket is just not a good idea. Continuing to fund research in multiple directions is the best way to hedge our bets against the changing world we will face over the next few decades. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and learned something new. Like, share, subscribe and start a discussion below to get more videos like this in your recommendations. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. I'll see you really soon. Bye.